Jesus Cuts Productions. In the late 90s, I was addicted to the Tomb Raider trilogy on PlayStation. At the time, the third title was the most anticipated game of my young gaming life. It exceeded expectations and would remain my favorite game of all time for many years. Right around the time I got the third entry, the fourth game was released in late 1999 for PlayStation, PC and Dreamcast. They were pumping out a new game every year. Like always, I got it a year later, this time as a Christmas gift in 2000, while my little brother got the first Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, he got a kid game for little babies, but I got a grand adventure for mature players only. My 10 year old self was beyond excited. To my surprise, the last revelation was a huge departure from the previous titles in some aspects and it put me off. In fact, my history with this game is quite complicated. While I loved the exploration in the first three games for the most part, this game just flat out confused me from the beginning. In the pre-internet age, I got stuck all the time and had to rely on sheets. Even those didn't really help. For the longest time, this was the only main Tomb Raider game I just couldn't beat without breaking the rules. In fact, the first time I beat it legit was in 2018. It took me 18 years to finally do it. You know, long enough for an adult to grow up. And you know what? I couldn't stand it. In my memory, it's one of the most frustrating and tedious games I have ever played. In a survey I did a few months ago, about half of the people said it's one of the better TR games and the other half said it's not. The opinions are very polarizing, which makes this whole topic a battlefield. So I have to be honest with you guys, I'm not looking forward to this in the slightest. Quite frankly, I dread the fact that I have to play it again. But since so many of you are asking for it and I'm on the quest to review all of them eventually, it's time to face my anxiety and give this game another shot. Who knows, maybe it'll surprise me. Can the last revelation change my mind? Let's dive into this massive game. The first thing that disappointed me back then was that Lara's home was nowhere to be seen. These sections were always a highlight for me that are fun to revisit today. This game starts with a tutorial instead, set back in 1984. Therefore we play as young 16 year old Lara, which is a nice surprise. It takes place in Anchor what? in Cambodia. She and her mentor Werner von Croy are searching for an artifact called the Iris. I could go on and review this level like usual, but I've already made a video about it in 2018. Since pretty much no one has ever seen it, I'll show it to you now. Keep in mind that this is a walkthrough that's played for laughs, but I think it perfectly captures how I feel about it. If you don't want to see it, just skip to the next chapter, I won't judge you. Alright, enjoy. Hey everyone, this is G from and welcome to my walkthrough of Tomb Raider The Last Revelation on the PlayStation. Of course we are starting with the first level, Anchor What? Anchor What? In this video I will collect every secret and every item without using a single med pack or saving. So first you... Oh Jesus, I can't even walk two steps without being interrupted? So what's so important, Werner? Yeah, I'm staying close alright. So, the first secret is right behind Werner. Pick up the golden skull. If you collect every secret in this level, the next level would be a little bit more challenging. Oh yes I will. Follow the path, but wait right in front of the holes in the ground. Good old Werner has to activate the spikes first. No need to hurry, Werner. Thank you. Continue straight forward, but don't... The first Jesus Christ. Small hop to I know how to jump. I've played Tomb Raider before, you know. Now, as I was trying to say, don't jump... Come, come, child. What? Let me play the goddamn game, man. Push forward and jump together. Don't push forward and jump together, but roll and drop back instead, because Werner clearly didn't see the golden skull down here. Grab the skull and use the stairs to get back up again. Now do as your creepy mentor says and jump over the pit. Follow the path. Ignore the boar and let Werner take care of it. You don't have any weapons anyway. 
Now, jump over the... Patience. Man. Disrespect is a route to carelessness. You won't get my respect from interrupting me all the time. Now, there's a secret down here, so you should... This gap is... Jesus fucking Christ, man. It's not that hard to jump over this goddamn pit. See? Now, let me get... This one calls... Fuck you, man! Fuck you! I'm just trying to get down here. Make your way down, go to the right and pick up the next golden skull. Now you have to make your way all the way back. So, jump over the pit again and then... Be careful now, child. We have little time for incompetence. Incompetence my ass! I was collecting a golden skull that you missed once again, mister! <sighs> Perform a running jump, grab the edge and pull yourself up. Was that so difficult, Herr von Kroy? After all this nonsense, walk to the left and head to the corner. A useful crack. Useful crack? I don't want to know about your useful crack, man. As I was saying, go to the corner and... Run to the wall. It's not even funny anymore. Grab the edge and shimmy to the right until you can pull yourself up. Follow Werner and get introduced to the fixed camera angles that no one on earth likes. Oh, what now? Let go of action to fall to the floor. Well, we're doing the exact opposite. Jump into the water because, guess what? There is a secret down here. Pick up the golden skull. If you swim straight forward, you will see a little entrance. If you swim through it and follow the path, you will find a small and a large medipack. Return to where you came from. Swim right and then right again. Now get out of the water. What? I can't hear you! Now do as the man says and get out of the water. Now you have to pull a switch. How come the gameplay isn't interrupted now? Why can't it always be like this? Whatever. Continue straight forward and wait for Werner to open the door. Thank you very much! So, how many steps can we take without being interrupted again? You will catch your death in those clothes, my dear. Why do you speak so quiet all of a sudden? Now we have to climb a ladder for the first time. Just go towards the ladder, push X and forward. I was already climbing, Werner! At least speak up when you're interrupting me, I can't hear a damn word you're saying! Turn around and hold X and forward to climb up the ladder. Up here you will find a switch. Pull the switch and climb down the ladder again. Release and push X repeatedly to get down faster. Go to the left and follow Werner up the steps. Swing across the monkey bars by jumping, then holding X and pushing forward. How is Werner so fast? Man, I wanna be just like him. Drop down and follow the path to the courtyard. Ignore the two boars and turn right three times. In this corner we will find the next golden skull. Go into the building. Walk down the steps towards an entrance with two lion statues. Avoid the spikes in the middle and turn right instead. Here is the next golden skull. Next you have to leave the building to the right side of the spikes. In this area... There is no mention of Why is he speaking so quietly all of a sudden? I can barely hear what he's saying. Now we have to crawl for the first time. Push L2 and then... I was just about to crawl! Do you think I'm fucking stupid, man? Now we can get away from Werner for a little while. Push L2 to crawl. Instead of crawling straight forward, crawl to the left. Here you will find the next golden skull. Man, I'm going insane here. Turn around and continue straight forward. In the following cutscene we get to see how Lara gets her signature backpack by stealing it from a dead guy. Classy. Pull the lever that is right next to you to open the giant door. Crawl back to our good friend Werner. Backpack. Now, now you're even interrupting yourself to interrupt me? What is wrong with you? Go down the stairs. Next up you have to avoid dart traps from the walls. You can do as Werner suggests and sprint past the darts while performing a diving roll at the end, but that has never really worked for me. If you want to beat this level without taking damage, I suggest crawling under the darts instead. Once you're up here, turn around to the right and pick up the last golden skull in the corner. Head towards the entrance on the opposite side. Werner will actually tell you something useful now. We have now reached the Garden of the Five Towers. If you didn't get all the golden skulls, Werner will open the path to the right. If you did, he will open the left one. 
Lara's answer will depend on the amount of skulls you collected as well. Of course we have all the skulls, so we have to take the root of the virtuous. Go down the steps and enter a room with a rope in the middle. Go to the left and... Now it becomes interesting, yeah? It's not interesting, yeah? Go to the left and pull yourself up into the little crawl space. In this game you have to push... Push forward. I was just about to say that. Turn around, go to the wall, push X and forward and now you have to hold L2 to get into the crawl space. You didn't have to push L2 in the third game, so that's new. Follow the path, turn right and continue towards the rope in the middle. Now this is a little bit tricky. Swing across to the alcove. Jump from the ledge, then hold down action to grab the vine. To release, let go of action. So hold on a second. Werner interrupts us like 5 million times and when we actually have to learn a completely new mechanic, he doesn't explain it properly? How do I swing, Werner von Kroy? Yeah, I know, by pushing R2, but for God's sakes, this is such an epic fail on so many levels. Pull the lever to open the final door. Now all you have to do is to drop down safely and leave this goddamn rage-inducing piece of shit tutorial level. So, we beat this level in 14 minutes and 31 seconds and found all 8 secrets and 2 items without using a single med pack or saving. So, what do I think of this level? It's fucking horrible. I can say from the bottom of my heart that this is one of my most hated levels in any video game. Why is it mandatory to play the tutorial? You didn't have to do it in the first three games. Meanwhile, I know that you can skip Werner's nonsense by pressing L1 of all buttons, but even then, I got interrupted 21 fucking times. And I know at least two instances that I missed by diving into the water. That's just too much, especially if you have already played this game before, which I'm sure most of you have. This is easily the worst first level in Tomb Raider history and definitely my most hated of them all, at least on the PS1. I hate it with a passion. And no, I don't use level codes anymore, but I used to do it all the time as a kid. One positive aspect that I can think of is that the ending is different depending on the amount of secrets you find. The less difficult path in this level is almost exactly the same, it just has a pool on the rope. But the second level is a little bit longer if you have all the secrets, so that's pretty cool. And although I can't stand Werner and don't care that much for young Lara to be honest, it's nice to see how they interact with each other, to a certain extent. As a tutorial level, I think it's pretty awful. The rope swinging isn't explained in full detail and the weapons don't even get mentioned. In combination with some pretty bland level design, it's safe to say that this level has nothing going for it, at least in my opinion. Thankfully, it can only get better from here. Man, I was angry back then. But truth be told, my opinion hasn't changed. Werner is an impolite, interrupting, know-it-all, snooty sack of shit. So let's move on with the review. The race for the iris is different depending on the amount of secrets we collected. The idea is to beat Werner in a race. We even get a useless timer. By getting all secrets in level 1, we get a more challenging course. Both aren't particularly difficult though. At first I wouldn't recommend going for speed because, let's face it, you'll die. Being behind Werner can be a disadvantage because he likes to close doors or collapse bridges. Classic 80s, shut the door on me because I'm not a man in a suit who snorts cocaine. It's not even required to win because all that changes is a tiny part of the dialogue in a cutscene. But I'm fucking Lara, I'm going for it anyway. That'll show him. All in all it's quite fun, albeit a short section. As Werner reaches for the iris, the temple starts to crumble. He slips and gets his foot stuck, so he's trapped. Lara can't help him, so she escapes to save her own skin. I know I should feel more compassion here, but I'm glad we're rid of his interrupting face. Flash forward to the present. You know, 1999. In a stunning CGI cutscene, we see Lara and a guide in the Egyptian desert. She finds some kind of mechanism and slides down into the tomb of Set. Ah, there it is, the classic outfit. Feeling like a 16 year old girl was nice for a while, but now we're grown up and badass. Now the real game finally begins. We get a little overview and see our guide lighting a torch. Before we follow him we pick up some flares. They look different than before. So does the shotgun. And the midi packs. Everything's different. I like that we see which item we've picked up, like in the first two games. Now they're in 3D! How far we've come. Oh god, what's that? A ghost? Nah, a wild dog. Other animals we need to kill are red scorpions. Luckily they aren't venomous. 
The guide can wipe out some of them too. We're already at a part I couldn't get past as a kid. It must have taken me an eternity to figure out that you can reach into these niches. That's something Werner never taught me. I'll never forgive him for it. Sometimes niches contain items, other times switches. By picking up an eyepiece, we open a door and find this circular room with blades rolling around the edge. Let's just say, don't touch them. Whoa, is this dog possessed? Ah, look at that, the Uzis. We're starting to gear up. To get past this trap, the guide has to disarm it. There's the second eyepiece. This might be a good opportunity to talk about the menu. Gone is the menu structure from the classic games that I loved so much. This new version looks cheaper. One cool addition is that we can combine items. In this case we combine the eyepieces to form the Eye of Horus. We insert it in the artifact receptacle to gain access to a cavern with a sphinx. The guide sets the pool of oil aflame to open a door. By pulling a chain, the guide again lights the oils. This way some of the symbols on the floor light up. I think it's obvious what we have to do. Just walk on those symbols to open the next door. We pick up the timeless sands. For a secret we climb up the sphinx. Pretty cool, but not as epic as in Sanctuary of the Skion. Again we need the guide to open another door for us. How come Lara can't do all of this stuff herself? Huh, what's up with him? Something scared him off. Wuss. Lara doesn't care and neither do we. As we place the timeless sands in the hand of the statue, the room fills with sand and reveals a crawl space in the sphinx's mouth. By crawling through it, we enter the next stage. The tomb of Set is a very atmospheric and intriguing level. The details are amazing and we're back to feeling trapped and isolated. The guide moves like a snail, but at least he's a helpful snail. It's a shame that we don't see the level stats at the end like before. That used to give me closure upon finishing a stage. Now it's just on to the next. Sure, there is a statistics screen, but that just shows the total playtime and secrets. Unlike the previous games, this one doesn't tell us how many secrets a level has. Going for all secrets is a total shitfest. You could end up with 69 secrets and never know you miss one. I hate that. Another thing I despise is that it doesn't even ask us to save. Speaking of saving, what the fuck happened here? Remember the beautiful level select screens of the past? Gone. Instead we have save files. So far so good, but each file takes up two blocks on a memory card. Nowadays I can just create as many virtual memory cards as I'd like on my PS3. But back then we only had like two or three of them and they were full of games. So I usually could only cram in one or two save files. Considering how long this game is and the fact that you can't go back if you missed anything, I think it was a horrible idea. It's a major reason I have a sour taste in my mouth when it comes to this game. Why am I mentioning all of this now? Because right at the beginning of Burial Chambers, you slide down a slope and have one chance to get a secret. There is no way to get it if you miss it. So better save every 5 minutes if you don't want to replay large chunks of a level. Here we pick up the Hand of Orion, but don't stand there too long. In this game we can shoot jars, some of which contain items. By inserting our new item, these blades start to rotate. They can be tricky to avoid with tank controls. Lara climbs onto a sarcophagus and rips off the Amulet of Horus. This causes blood to flow from it. Damn, that's quite a fountain. Uh oh, the sarcophagi are open. There are mummies inside but they're completely still. We can aim at them. And we need to get past this dude. So we all know what that means. Oh shit, it's alive! Apparently it can't be killed with pistols. Let's just get away from here. Ugh, that noise. Instead of wild dogs attacking us, we have to deal with jackals with gold jewels. Holy crap, this game is dark. More mummies on the floor. Sounds like they're barfing. They are so slow, especially compared to the mummies in Tomb Raider 1. More annoying than scary. After picking up a golden serpent, we move on to a room where the sand is rising. Think fast! Phew, the jackals look cool. I miss the times when dead enemies didn't disappear after a few seconds. There's no proof of Lara's killing spree. How are we supposed to feel guilty now? I remember this octagonal room all too well. Levers caused the room to rotate. Brilliant concept. We pick up the Hand of Sirius. The rotating room is a bit disorienting, but I enjoyed it immensely. By placing the Hand of Sirius in the receptacle, we lower a rope to get to a scarab talisman. 
In a small room with a mummy on the floor, we place the golden serpent and scarab talisman in receptacles. The room fills with sand and the mummy awakes. This part is just really boring because it's enough to run around in circles to avoid the mummy. After that dizzying encounter, the level is over. Burial Chambers is amazing. Like the previous level, it excels at creating this creepy atmosphere and the surroundings are stunning. The only part I don't get a kick out of are the slowpoke mummies. In a CGI cutscene, Lara reads the inscription of the Amulet of Horus. Basically, by removing the amulet, Lara released Set, the ruler of evil who will unleash a plague. Great job, Lara. Your selfish treasure hunting finally caught up with you. Suddenly, the guide shows up and points a gun at Lara's head. Backstabbing snail prick. She manages to gain the upper hand as a lightning bolt strikes the entrance of the tomb. But he has backup. Valley of the Kings starts with our first encounter with human enemies. These guys come with Uzis and blades. One of them drops an ignition key. The guide escapes in a Land Rover. Well, he doesn't drive off until we start the Jeep. How considerate. So yeah, this is the first vehicle section. If you've seen my previous videos, you know that I've had a troubled relationship with the snow scooters, minecarts and kayaks of the past. But this jeep actually controls pretty well. Not amazing or anything, but I kinda dig it. It's so much fun to run over people to a bumping tune. The douche throws grenades at us, but I took my sweet time and didn't really chase him at all. Less stressful. Plus, there's plenty of goodies to pick up along the way. I beat the stage in under 10 minutes, but it's a memorable chapter that offers a rare moment of pure fun in an otherwise atmosphere-heavy game. The next level, called KV-5, continues the chase scene. This is so cool. Here's a dead end, so we have to figure out a way to open the gate. With these switches, we have to jump up to pull them down with our weight. Holy fuck, what the hell? And grenades too? What an evil bastard. We could just chase after him, but we don't want to miss secrets. God damn it. Where did I save? Ugh, no. Fuck my life. Anyway, the chase sequence isn't that long or difficult for that matter, so we're done in no time. While I didn't enjoy this stage as much as the last one, it's still a fun romp. Who saw it coming that I would enjoy a vehicle section that much? I sure as hell didn't. A cutscene shows Lara on a suicide mission trying to break through a blockade of bad guys with guns and rocket launchers. In a rather unexpected plot twist, it turns out Werner is still alive. So these were his men? And I thought I couldn't detest him more. Lara meets with her friend Jean-Yves. She gives him the amulet and he reads from an ancient manuscript. So there was this guy Semerchet who was a human ally to Set. He predicted that Lara would release Set at the turn of the millennium and left instructions for summoning Horus, the sun god. They conclude that Werner is after Horus's armor, which is needed to complete the ceremony. Lara then takes off to Karnak. Before we continue, I need to explain something. The rest of the game is divided into four parts, each in a different city. Whereas we had the regular level structure from previous games so far, the upcoming Karnak chapter has three levels that are interconnected. Meaning that we not only can, but have to travel back and forth between these levels. You can call it one big level with three different sections separated by loading screens. We start in Temple of Karnak and leave our jeep behind. Damn, you could have killed yourself, Lara. There are several ways we can go. Contrary to the red scorpions, the black ones are venomous. Yeah, you remember being poisoned in TR3, right? Well, here it actually messes up your vision after a while. It's quite trippy. Here's something I had trouble figuring out as a kid. See this door underwater? There's no switch that opens it anywhere. Get this. We can open it with our bare hands. This is madness. Another thing Werner didn't teach us, yeah? Oh, come on, man. What the hell? God damn it, Lara, hurry! So far, I've only found secrets and a canopic jar. So it's back to the beginning. Let's try another way. Here we have a room with a ceremonial bowl. I don't know what to do with it. So we monkey swing across a pit and push a button that opens the door to a niche, which then lowers the bowl. Best to drop down to it. Again, there are several ways we can go and the only way to figure out the right path is to take a wild guess. I was confused for a while. Eventually, I put the canopic jar in its place and found the exit to the second part. 
Lara slides down a ramp to the Great Hypostyle Hall. In a room with square pillars, we fight a few scorpions. There's not much to do here except monkey swing and picking up some items. Eventually we trigger a cutscene. Werner and his henchmen find Lara's jeep. So I guess our peaceful scorpion hunting days are over. After, her. After only 9 minutes we slide down another slope to the third section. Contrary to what I expected, Sacred Lake starts with a crocodile attack instead of Werner's goons. And them bats. Haven't killed one of them since Palace Midas. What's up with this thing? I can't do anything with it. Maybe later. So this is the Sacred Lake, huh? A Sacred Lake filled with crocodiles. Below the torch is a room with two poles. Can I jump at them? Better save first. Yes, I've learned from my mistakes. And yes, we're supposed to climb up the poles. If you ever had fantasies of Lara Croft, the wealthy British pole dancer, this is as close as you'll get. We pull a chain and open a gate. Back to the crocodile infested lake. Behind the gate we just opened, I was stuck at first. Can I open this with my bare hands? No. This time it's a lever we need to pull. How silly of me to think we can open stuff on our own. We have to swim through corridors and I keep getting stuck on walls. Oh shit, almost out of air. A mirror? Oh, I remember this part. The mirror reveals an air socket. Creepy shit. Another opening leads us to the second canopic jar. This opens another gate and the current draws us back to Temple of Karnak. We place the second canopic jar opposite the first. Some sort of liquid flows from the bowl into the water. Let's swim back. Holy lord, do you see what I see? It's official. Lara Croft is the violent sister of Jesus Christ. The New Testament was lying to you. This allows us to get to places we couldn't reach before and leads us to another pool. Beware of Lara Christ, you pathetic crocs. Hey, what the hell? I knew it, she's a con artist. On top of all that unholy shit. All that money must have come from somewhere. What's up with the electricity? Is Dr. Frankenstein around? A button lowers the cage. On the pedestal we pick up the hypostyle key and the sun goddess. In contrast to previous games, here she only picks up one item at a time. Lara decides it's Jesus time again and we're on our way to crawl through the opening we ignored the first time around. Here Werner's Uzi wielding henchmen wait for us. Back at the beginning more of them wish to be shot. After that we once again slide down to the great hypostyle hall. This time we stay here a little longer. A guy with a black and red robe attacks us. I hate these assholes. By twirling their knives they can't be shot at. Draw the pistols, shoot and drop the weapons again. It's the circle of life. Depressing, I know. Especially when there's two of them. Oh god, that was so unnecessary. The hypostyle key opens the door to a series of three rooms. Have mercy. Eventually I found a switch that raises a trap door. Oh no, these guys can monkey swing too? You know what I hate? Fixed camera angles like in Resident Evil. What's their purpose in a Tomb Raider game? I had no clue what to do here and wandered around for a while. You know what we need to do? Shoot at the boulder on the pillar to make it roll down and blow a fucking hole in the floor. Are you kidding me? Shooting at a boulder with pistol bullets? Somebody call the Mythbusters. Anyway, the hole leads us to some kind of glowing pyramid. Looks pretty cool. No. No? What no? No to chains? Well fuck chains then I guess. There are three rooms we can go to, each with a wheel. These wheels need to be turned so that the needles below face the pyramid. Not too complicated, but I managed to die here anyway. Classic G from bullshit. Now we can pull the chain. Say yes to chains. Well, only in certain contexts. The pyramid explodes and reveals the sun disk. It's so small you can barely see it. With this item in our possession we return to Sacred Lake. We combine the sun disk with the sun goddess to form the sun talisman. Ah, that's what this thing is for. Some crazy magic happens and opens three doors. There isn't much going on. Basically we need to find a way out of here. There's lots of ammo so it's best to look in every corner. After a short while we trigger a CGI cutscene. Lara uses the amulet of Horus to open the door to a tomb. She sees something in the darkness but gets surprised by Werner. Long time no see. Von Croy. After a very brief but tense conversation she straight up shoots at him but misses. He takes the amulet causing the doors to close. With Lara stuck in the tomb the clouds turn dark.
Instead of giving my final opinion on all three stages individually, I see them more as one big stage. So in total I enjoyed this section quite a bit. It had some confusing moments where I didn't know what to do at first, but for the most part it was fine. I can't say I'm a fan of this level concept. You can't just go back to a previous level if you forgot something because of slopes for example. As you never know if you've missed anything, moving on to another level can be risky. The loading screens come by surprise. There aren't that many enemies, which is good. It has supernatural elements, interesting settings and you're basically the daughter of God. As a kid this whole part gave me trouble, but today? Not so much. Next up is Tomb of Semerchet. This level scared the crap out of me as a kid. As we slide down, a swarm of beetles come scuttling towards us. I saw the mummy around the same time I played this back then and that scene with the beetle was traumatizing. You know which one. They can't be killed, so run, run, run. They can't reach us up here. With a lit torch in our hands, they won't attack us, but it's useless when we need to activate mechanisms. We have to drop the torch first and they don't care about it when it's on the floor. Makes no sense. And they drain our energy fast. I hate this so much. Just outrun them and don't bother with the torch. We drop down into a room that has some kind of giant game board. More on that later. This level is full of different paths and shortcuts, so it's hard to navigate. Here's a room with three flames shooting under the walls. Looks like niches with mechanisms. Oh no, seriously? Yeah, as you probably guessed, we have to grab into the niches when the fire is out. It's like something you would see in Saw, only less graphic. Being burned alive can't be so bad, right? Lara just looks tired, that's all. Next we get six niches with flames. The mechanisms need to be activated in the right order. It's not as bad as it sounds. We pick up the rules of Senate, so back to the game board. The giant freaking head of Semerchet comes out of the wall. Now it's time to play Senate against it. Senate is a game that was played by the ancient Egyptians. It's quite easy to understand. We spin these tiles. For every white tile we advance one of our three pieces by one step. Getting four black tiles counts as six and allows us to spin again. That's also the case when the piece lands on an arc. We need to step on one of the three colored squares to decide which piece gets moved. If you land on a square with an opponent, he gets sent back to the start. The last square must be reached by spinning the exact number. Reach the end with all three pieces and we've won. This is something else, I gotta say. But it's actually fun. Who would have thought? There's just one major gripe that screws with my mind so much it almost hurts. By normal instinct you would try to win this thing, right? If you lose, reload and try again. And sure, you can do that. The level will be over very shortly and we're all happy and gleeful. But guess what? If you win, you'll miss five secrets. Yeah, five! What's the point of winning if winning means losing? You mean I have to lose on purpose to get all secrets in this game? If you lose, four trap doors open and this way is much longer and more dangerous than the winning path. I get that, it's punishment. But why punish my hot senate skills by taking away five secrets from me that I can't get any other way? Who made this decision? It baffles my mind on so many levels. Anyway, so we lose on purpose or by accident and leave the area. We need to move the senate pieces to a specific spot and pull a lever. Two majestic hammers smashed them to pieces, revealing cartouche pieces. We open a door by combining the two pieces to the Ba cartouche. And hey, where did they come from? Freaking jackal jackasses. Another piece. You know, this is a little faster than pushing and pulling the old blocks, but it's still boring as hell. Especially when the floor burns us. God. Damn it! There is a switch that deactivates the burners, but only for a short while. You know the drill. Smash it to get the raw cartouche, which opens another door. What the hell is that? A fucking fire ghost or something? Apparently it's called a fire wraith. How would I know? I'm not a native speaker. How fun is it to catch fire while hanging from a rope? It's only really a problem when we stand still. So now this thing is chasing us. How do we get rid of it? Motherfucker! <sighs> We get rid of it by seeking the help of an ice wraith. They're like yin and yang, except they're mortal enemies and kill each other. At least on PC from what I've read. On PlayStation they just dance around each other for all eternity. At least they leave us alone. The noises still annoy me though. This next part also has a swing from rope to rope. 
That shit always makes me nervous because the controls are so stiff. Eventually we get another torch and use it to light two more torches. This opens a trap door to a secret that has these weird circular blade traps. Well this looks easy, just roll through it, right? Oh, I had the right idea. And of course we have more beetles on our ass. Beautiful. The beetles can crawl up some areas, but not ladders. So it's back to rope swinging again, but the end is near. The fucking wraiths are still going at it. Bye bye Lara reads some inscriptions. The ruler of darkness, Set, is free. The person who removed the amulet of Horus shall summon the sun god Horus to imprison Set again. I think you fucked up, Miss Croft. This should be a meme. Then she hears a noise. Tomb of Semerchet is a very long level. It took me about 100 minutes, one hour of which came after the lost game of Senate. The atmosphere is great as usual, but it has some parts I don't care for, like rope swinging, the stupid ghost thingies, beetles and an abundance of fire traps. The worst offender is having to lose Senate, but I don't want to go on about that any longer like a sore loser. I'm sure many people like it a lot, but I get annoyed by it too often. Guardian of Semerchet is the final Karnak level with more of those disco blade traps. There's some kind of map on the floor. Hmm, this looks interesting. Let's spin the wheel and see what it does. How many times do I have to spin it? I have no idea. Whoa, damn blades! Let's try the upper ledge. Holy crap, this place wants to kill me. Just keep running and grab the golden Vreus. Uraeus? I don't know. Son of a bitch! Got lucky there. We used this item back where the map was. This activates... whatever that thing is. A laser? Is Goldfinger or Dr. Evil nearby? Do you expect me to talk? How about no? Anyway, that wimpy laser doesn't hurt us. So we pick up the guardian key and insert it here. After sliding down a ramp we get into a hallway. Something is slamming against the door. Let's just ignore it and run away from our problems like anyone would. Instead we deal with more flame niches. It's a bit confusing and easy to miss that we have to reach into them twice sometimes. Once for an item and the second time to activate a mechanism. One of them even releases a bunch of beetles and nothing else just to mess with us. Back in the hallway... What is that? Hot damn, a fucking pissed off bull with armor? This bad boy can't be killed, so all we can do is run for our lives. Damn bats, I don't have time for you. Too many animals for one day. What we need to do here is grab a torch, light it and then light two sconces on the walls to get to a secret. We're safe here. Save my ass. What's up with that spiky ball? Pointless. So what about that bull? Not only is it frightening and unreasonably angry, it's strangely useful too. We can lure it to smash open doors and ram into buttons. You're my favorite dumb animal. It doesn't always work the first time, but I can see the humor in it. Run away once again and we get a cutscene. Laura surprises our old friend the guide with a pistol to the head and learns that Werner is headed to Alexandria. She knocks him out, steals his clothes, leaves him in the tomb and gets on board a train. Yeah sure Lara, nobody will notice anything. The guide usually walks around with two colossal balloons under his robe, so business as usual. Meanwhile the guide has a little run in with Set. He's fucked. Guardian of Semerchet is much shorter than the previous stage, which is a huge relief. The bull gives it an interesting twist and the setting is great as usual. It's nothing spectacular, but it gets the job done. Overall, the Karnak chapter is a milder experience now that I'm older, wiser and just a tad more patient. I still prefer most of the chapters in previous entries, but I see it in a more positive light now. I wonder if the rest of the game can surprise me as much. Desert Railroad is like a transition level between two chapters. The entire thing takes place on a moving train. That blew my mind as a kid. Sure, nowadays we're spoiled by the likes of Uncharted 2's train level, but back then I had never seen anything like it. Therefore it was pretty much the only level that I not only liked, but loved. I remember showing it to a friend who's sadly no longer with us and he was equally impressed. That's a little memory I will cherish as long as I live. 
Does it hold up today? It's obviously a linear stage that sadly has too many fixed camera angles. It's just awkward. And it brings back the blade wielding Uzi blasting sons of bitches. There are some cinematic moments thrown in for added drama. I really hate these guys. What's our goal here exactly? Basically we jump from wagon to wagon, get inside occasionally and kill people. This right here gives me anxiety. A helicopter swoops in. I guess that means we have to deal with more nameless dudes. Oh well. It took longer than necessary to finish this level because I spent too much time running around like an idiot looking for the crowbar. We can use it as a lever. Dude's got moves. The second secret gives us the grenade gun. Now we're talking. Nathan Drake's got nothing on these guys. Finally, we used the crowbar one more time, open a door and finish the stage with just a few wagons left. I gotta be honest. While the stage is impressive on a technical level, its gameplay is dull. These are among the most tedious enemies to fight and there are too many of them. Desert Railroad breaks up the pace though and I appreciate it for that. This marks the start of the Alexandria chapter. The first part is quick. There are some gunmen and scorpions to kill, but other than that, the only purpose of this level is to visit our good friend Jean-Yves. There is still time to prepare for set. Jean, I'm tired. Give a girl a break. We don't take breaks! He has some leads about the armor of Horus. Before we leave, we steal some of his stuff like a laser sight. Can't use it yet. That's it. We can return to Jean-Yves from time to time to get more information, but I didn't do that. It's not even a real level, so let's continue. Coastal Ruins is the main hub of Alexandria. But first things first. We enter some kind of closed off attraction called Egyptian Adventure. A mummy! <laughs> oh, I see. Got me there. Great, we need to shoot the targets, but we have nothing to aim with. There's no way to escape. What a gruesome place. So I got here too early. Trial and error bullshit. We're headed into a seemingly empty room. What the fuck? Where did the spikes come from? Upon closer inspection, you'll notice a mirror that reveals where it's safe to stand. I still managed to die a bunch of times because I wasn't paying attention. The reward is a crossbow. We've been collecting ammo for this thing like crazy, so it's great to finally be able to use it. Damn it! Combine the crossbow with the laser sight. Aiming is a bit choppy, so precision isn't its strong suit. Oh man, there's so little time. Will we be able to shoot them all? Did I forget to tell you about explosive arrows? Now you know. The reward is a token which we can use to activate a snake charmer that breaks down. We climb up the magical rope and pick up the broken handle. Then we need to use the crowbar which thankfully is still in our inventory to break the hook out of the wall. But not this one, no! It has to be the one on the left. The first time I did this I just assumed it was decoration. Very misleading. By combining the broken handle with the hook, we get a hook and pole. We use it to get the gate key behind these bars. But pay attention, the key is not in our hands yet. The game still makes us pick up the item first. It's so easy to miss. Here we arrive at the hub area I mentioned earlier. Remember how Karnak had three interconnecting levels? Of course you do. They weren't too bad because essentially we were just running in circles, revisiting them in the same order. Alexandria is a totally different beast. This area has several entry and exit points to different levels and without a guide it's not very clear where to start or what our goal is. Too bad we pretty much left our guide for dead. Before we enter one of the other levels, there's stuff to do here first. Uh, game? Are you feeling okay? What's up with that skeleton back there? Let's zoom in on it. Yeah, so the skeletons are super pesky because they can't be killed with pistols. We can either shoot their heads off with a crossbow, knock them down edges with a shotgun or simply blow them up. You know what I like to do. This cutscene scared me as a kid. Back then I didn't know you could blow them up, so I couldn't get rid of them. Today, however... All you bony creatures shall tremble before my explosives. The gate key opens this door and we enter the next level called Catacombs. But only for a few seconds. The only thing we do here is push a tile which makes a block rise somewhere else. Back in coastal ruins we find a torch that conveniently lays next to a brazier. We set the rope on fire and the boulder drops revealing a crawl space. Again we enter Catacombs. Due to the raised block we can pull the pillar onto it. Then it's back to coastal ruins and on to the first entrance of Catacombs. 
I don't like hopping between levels like that. The loading screens break up the pace and I'm never sure if I'm really supposed to leave the level. Did I miss anything? You'll never know. Catacombs is the level I gave up on as a kid. I hated it so much and I couldn't figure it out, so I cheated my way forward. We didn't have the internet back then at home, but I had a cheat book. Take that, game. Let's see if it still drives me nuts. Of course it starts with us having to pull and push a pillar. I want to smash this pillar to pieces. Behold the ultimate time waster. It's impressive how strong she is though. I'd probably take two minutes longer. As we enter the open door, an air wraith gets on our nerves. It only does a little bit of damage on contact. The only way to get rid of it is to stand close to this little bird statue and wait a bit. Not too obvious either. We slide down the pole and the wall first rises and then closes behind us. It starts to shake and we pull a lever. That's pretty cool, I got to say. This room is huge. For the first secret we need to swing from rope to rope. Easier said than done. It took me 10 fucking minutes to get this one jump right. One fucking jump. I'm sure many people don't have problems with this part, but in all these years I never figured it out. I've read some tips, but still failed. When I think of this level, the first thing that comes to mind are skeletons. And boy are there lots. Mostly they're at safe distance, so it's not as terrifying as my childhood memories made me believe. I still try to save ammo by shooting an explosive arrow when they're close to each other, killing several with one shot. In this flooded room we have to make ledges appear by pulling levers. Another air wraith chases us, but there's a bird statue underwater. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that Lara can shimmy around corners in this game. Yeah? That's actually a great addition to her moveset, something I wish earlier games had. In this rather imposing room we deal with a ton of skeletons and pick up the first of four tridents. The second one isn't too far away. As if this level didn't have enough large rooms, here's another one with three floors. Here we find the third trident. Let's see if I can jump into the opening. Of course not. And now I present to you one of the most cryptic secrets in the entire series. See those piles of bones? We need to shoot five of these piles that are scattered across this room in order to reveal another room. How the fuck would you figure that out on your own? I sure as hell didn't. One funny detail is that the skeletons run around aimlessly when you shoot their heads off. So we pick up the fourth trident and climb up a ladder which leads us back to coastal ruins. We only do this to open two gates with the crowbar, just in case we need to get back here later. Back to catacombs. With all the tridents at hand we return to the first large room and move on to the next level. Is catacombs as bad as I remembered? Not really. Sure, I hate rope swinging and skeletons, but it wasn't nearly as confusing as I thought. I can't say it excited me and I didn't really enjoy the setting that much. It has some cool moments, but other than being a childhood trauma, it's rather unspectacular, honestly. In Temple of Poseidon, the main area is a junction with a deep pit. Again, it's a skeleton party. The basic idea is that we have to attach the four tridents we got in catacombs onto the staff of Poseidon statues. That means we have four hallways to explore. We can check them out in any order we like. The first is straightforward and has some burners that activate if we get too close. By attaching the trident, water starts to flow from the statue to the pit. The second just has us climb a ladder and kill a skeleton. Then an air wraith starts chasing us. There's a bird statue at the beginning of the stage, so it's just a mild annoyance. You think? Why doesn't it die? Is this a glitch? Finally. The third room has us climb a pole and kill more skeletons. It's starting to get old. The final room... Okay, how am I supposed to not get burned? Maybe if I just carefully... Cool. The rest is pretty much the usual stuff. With all four tridents in their place, the pit gets filled with water. Two more air wraiths start attacking us, but there are statues hidden in the urns. The sarcophagus contains the first piece of Horus' armor, the left gauntlet. Here we have two options. We can return to coastal ruins and maybe talk to Jean-Yves in Alexandria. Or if you don't care about chit chat like me, we enter the next level. Temple of Poseidon is a rather straightforward stage that's self-explanatory. I like the concept with the four rooms but wish they were more varied. It could have been a great stage, instead it's just average.
The Lost Library gave me a migraine the last time I played it. From what I remember, this is one of the most complicated levels in Tomb Raider history. Oh well, let's not waste any more time! Entering the main hall brings back the memories of confusion. There are six doors on the bottom floor. Some can be opened, others can't. Where do we start? Who knows? It's a guessing game. I decided to go here first and I instantly regret it. There's a pole and some blades that circle around the opening. Is it even possible to get down there without taking damage? We could have tried a more careful approach, but I figured we'd take damage anyway, so who cares. Then we get attacked by some kind of mechanical dude waving an axe. His weakness is shooting the blue gem in his chest. It's pretty easy when we just let him keep running at us while hopping backwards and firing our guns at him. With the crowbar, we ripped the golden star out of the column. This next part confused me. Touching the chains obviously hurts us. There's nothing to do underwater, so maybe we got here too early. Sure enough, we missed a ladder that leads to an area with two mech dudes. Then there's a mechanical horse just standing there in the middle of the room. A cutscene shows a dude mount the horse. So yeah, this kind of feels like the first mini boss. It's not very difficult, but it takes quite a punch. Explosives won't work, but you know me. I'm notorious for just using pistols for a majority of these games anyway. After a while he gets off the horse, but still takes more damage than any of the other guys. With pistols, this fight took about 2 minutes and was a piece of cake. He leaves behind the horseman's gem. A secret has to shoot a metal ball with an arrow to open a door. We really have to pay attention in this game. The gem opens a door with a chain inside. Ah, so now we can return to the water section. Here we find two more golden stars. Then it's back up the poles with the blades. It's so hard not to take damage here. I hate parts like that. Back in the main hall we enter a reading room. Two fire wraiths attack us, but like any decent reading room, this one also has a pool inside. At first I thought there was no point in going here, but Lara kept looking up at the chute. It's pitch black. Then I remembered we have binoculars with a flashlight. First time we use it. Hmm, a clue? Looks like planets orbiting around a blue planet. Earth? I don't know. Have to remember this. Blue, white, green, red, yellow. Blue, white, green, red, yellow. Got it. And wouldn't you know it, the next room is a planetarium. It looks awesome. With the golden stars we open gates that contain globes with different colors. Oh no! You know what this means? Yep. We have to push the globes onto the circles on the floor, just like in the clue. Blue. White. Green, red, yellow. Never in my life have I endured such boring shit. It took me seven minutes. Seven minutes of monotonous pushing and hearing the same sound over and over. Fuck this. At least we get a cool visual effect after completion. This leads us to another puzzle. So by pulling the lever on a statue, we either turn on or off the fire. Each statue is connected to two more of them. So obviously we need to activate all of them. Easier said than done. It left me scratching my head in confusion for 8 minutes until I finally got it. The PlayStation version rewards us with a fire wraith. Thanks. Anyway, it also raised some blocks that lead us to the archives and eventually the upper level of the main hall with five more doors. As if the level wasn't confusing enough. A room with two lion heads manages to stick out. We see a globe rolling down a ramp. Okay. When we get down there, the game pretends that we're in danger but nothing happens. What's that all about? I guess we triggered the globe too early by going for a secret. It looks like we can crawl into the lion's mouth, but it won't work. So I kept looking and looking but couldn't find a way out. I tried again and suddenly it worked. Why? I thought I had tried the ducking approach before, but maybe I didn't. Here we pick up the pharaoh's pillar. Next we find a torch and activate the brazier to light it. There's a wooden floor. Maybe we can set it on fire. It takes a while, but it works. Lara keeps staring at one of the scrolls. Turns out we need to pick up the music scroll. Now there's only two places we haven't been to yet. One room has us fight two more mechs. Here's another scroll. Let's read it. Oh wow. So you're trying to tell me that we just had to go in circles at the fire puzzle? Thanks for the clue. Upon doing a little research, I found out that you can't pick up the scroll unless you've been to the fire room first. That's so random. Now it's too late anyway. 
In the final room we place the music scroll on a stand and Lara plays some tunes on a harp. A second career opportunity maybe? This opens a door and we pull a chain. Now the big doors in the main hall are open and we leave this place. <laughs> the lost library. More like lost in the library. This is one complicated mother of all mindfucks. A room with this many doors can feel overwhelming at first. After a while I started to feel familiar with my surroundings. I hate both puzzles, especially the planet Arium. Such a waste of time. The blades and fire wraiths are terrible too. Other than that it's not too painful, but I wouldn't call it top tier. Hall of Demetrius starts with another huge room. Give me a break! To my relief it's nothing like the previous stage. We pick up the pharaoh's knot and shortly after we're surprised by Werner and his goons. Lara escapes but has to fend off some mercenaries. Werner's gone. We find scrape marks on the floor. Maybe if we pull the lantern? Ah, oh, and you know what? That's it! Including the cutscene, this level didn't even take me 4 minutes. Why is this even a stage? Couldn't they have included it in Lost in the Library? Whatever. Not much to say about this little interlude. So we're back in coastal ruins. There are Werner's broken glasses. From what I know, there's no point in picking them up. Again we can either go back to Jean-Yves for a little chit chat or simply go on with our adventure. It's unclear where our next destination is but I managed to find an underwater passage that leads to a stage we haven't been to yet. And that's the last we see of this hub level. It's not as confusing as I remembered it to be. While the Egyptian adventure part is quite unique it's also a bit irritating. So before anyone asks I prefer coastal village over coastal ruins. Thank you very much. Oh god I remember this. Pharaoh's Temple of Isis starts underwater in front of ruins. Back then when I used to exploit the level skip cheat, I couldn't get further than this because it kept looping between levels. By the way, you have to face north to cheat. The only time the compass comes in handy. Good luck facing exactly north on the water. Anyway, I would always end up here with no clue what to do. Now of course we have the Pharaoh's Pillar and the Pharaoh's Knot and use them to get into the temple. But there's a goddamn hammerhead shark that wants us for dinner. Where's the useless harpoon gun when you need it? This level marks the return of the skeletons. Just when I got used to their absence. We open a door and... What's happening? Why can't I swim through? Is there a current? I'm pretty sure that's the way to go. There's nothing else we can do. I had to look this up and found out that this is a common glitch that prevents players from progressing. What the fuck man? Imagine if you only had one save file like I used to have back then. Imagine if you saved after opening the door. You're doomed. This is unacceptable. So I had to reload and this time I could swim through. What a bunch of bullshit. A golden serpent called Ureus attacks us. It has several attacks but here it just flew around aimlessly. There are three staircases. Let's take the left one first. We enter a room with an Isis statue. The door behind us closes. Here we need to pry out beetles with a crowbar. Some are called black beetles and others are broken beetles. Doing this causes a bunch of real beetles to chase us again. I did not miss these fellas. We can trick them to fall into a hole but we need to get down there too. Here we find a winding key and push a tile to reopen the door. The middle stairs lead to a small black pyramid. Here are three chutes that all have the same basic premise. As we slide down into a pool of oil we only have a few seconds to climb out before it's set on fire. Dealing with live beetles in this setting is quite stressful. The right set of stairs lead us to the next level called Cleopatra's Palaces. There isn't much we can do here yet but we need to find one more black beetle. Same thing here, don't get burned. Back in Pharaoh's Temple of Isis we fight another golden Ureus and insert the black beetles into the pyramid. This reveals the mechanical scarab which will be useful in the next stage. And that's where we're headed. With the exception of that dumb glitch in the beginning this is a fine level. Again I wish there was a little more variety instead of having us jump into so many oil pools but I can't complain too much. Let's wash that mess away with a new level. The first thing I did in Cleopatra's palaces was to get stuck here. Sometimes this game just pisses me off. 
Why doesn't she just swim through the freaking opening? We need to combine the mechanical scarab with the winding key to form the elegantly called mechanical scarab with key. You see, we can't continue here because we'd get killed by spikes. Our little friend can help us out. If we place it here, it will walk over the little holes in the floor, thus activating the spikes and making it safe for us to traverse. We have to do this several times. It can only be used thrice and we need it to get to a secret. More trial and error. The goal is to collect the remaining pieces of Horus's armor. Here's the right gauntlet, but we have to watch out for blade traps. Some other sarcophaguses contain medipacks or shotgun shells. I find that very hard to believe. Walking skeletons and flying golden ureuses? No problem. But modern shotgun ammo in an old Egyptian coffin? That's unrealistic. This part had me running around aimlessly for a while. It wasn't until I remembered that we can shimmy around corners that progress was made. By now we've also collected the right grieve and another pharaoh's knot. With the latter we open a door. In this room we pick up a medipack and suddenly a golden Lara statue appears out of thin air. We can aim at it, but shooting it only hurts us. Reminds me a bit of Mutant Laura in Atlantis. This room has several floors and we have to make it to the top. The only problem is that more golden ureuses appear and they attack our precious gold Lara, shooting energy blasts and whatnot. This drains our health, so we have to protect her like a little shiny baby. What I hate most about this is that Lara often aims at the statue instead of the bird. Are you fucking stupid? Just aim for the feathered piece of shit, goddammit! It'd probably be easier if we just made our way down, but I don't want to climb up again. Thankfully, we're packed with medicine. Apparently you can tap L1 to switch targets, but I didn't know that until the very moment I wrote this into the script. That damn L1 button reminds me of when I discovered that you can skip Werner's bullshit in 2018. So I was just about to re-record some footage for the Tomb Raider 4 part of this video, since I was missing something, and then I found out by a complete freak accident that you actually can skip the tutorials. How? Not by pushing a button, no, by holding L1. Yeah, holding it. How was I supposed to know that? That doesn't work on any other cutscene in the game. So you're telling me that after almost 20 years, this is how I found out about it, by just randomly holding L1 and being able to skip this part? How much time have I wasted listening to Werner's bullshit all the time? Man, I hate the game and I hate myself for it. God damn it! After doing this several times, we pick up the ornate handle and the Hather effigy. That's not something you say every day. They're combined to form the portal guardian, which is placed right here. We enter a room with what I suppose is Cleopatra's throne. Yeah, I'd probably sit there too for a while. But uh oh, two guardians have a problem with that. They shoot blue bolts of energy. Well, only one of them. The other one's just standing there dumbstruck. With pistols it takes quite a while to take them out, but I'd do anything to save ammo. Especially when all we have to do is side flip to avoid taking damage. Once they're dead, we pick up the left grieve and the breastplate. Now the armor is complete. In a CGI cutscene, Lara returns to Jean-Yves' place, but he's missing. She finds a letter written to her by Werner. He wants the armor in exchange for Jean-Yves' life. What an asshole. We see him drive across the desert as a swarm of locusts show up. Turns out he's possessed by Set. That doesn't make things simple. Lara follows him to Cairo with a motorcycle. While Cleopatra's palaces is one of the more beautiful levels with water fountains and greens everywhere, I didn't have a great time here. Protecting the statue dragged up the playtime and the beginning section with the mechanical beetle is too sluggish for my taste. Overall, Alexandria isn't nearly as bad or impossible to figure out as I had in my mind. I'd advise you to check out a guide to at least read about in which order the levels need to be visited if you run out of patience. At first it can be very overwhelming. Most of the levels are a single visit, which is a plus in my book. I still prefer the previous two chapters. But now it's on to Cairo. Oh boy. In my memory, Cairo haunts me as the most confusing chapter in all of PS1 Tomb Raider. Why? It contains six levels, five of which are interconnected. Unlike Alexandria, we have to scurry back and forth between these levels constantly and it's never clear where we're supposed to go. I mean, look at this map I found on tombraiders.net. It's completely insane. For that reason, I won't give a conclusion to each level, because to me it's one giant ass level with a bunch of loading screens between sections. Kinda like Angel of Darkness would do a few years later, but less atrocious. City of the Dead is a level that scared me as a kid. I mean, look at the green sky. It's so dark and creepy. You just know some creature will sneak up on us at some point. 
Surprisingly, our first encounters are with snipers. One of them drops the revolver. Now we have all weapons. We can combine it with a laser sight. Headshot! It's annoying that you have to remove it from the crossbow first. Some of the soldiers can be run over with our motorcycle. It controls quite well unless we get stuck in a corner. So the guys aren't the problem. There are two machine guns on the roof and they deal massive damage and aim automatically at us. What we have to do is make them aim to the right, sneak past them and shoot at the little red triangle on the back. Easier said than done when the fucking scope is red. I wasted too much ammo so I reloaded a couple of times until I got it right. There's a dead guy on the trap door. Oh, we can actually pull him away. That's a first. Why do we have to do that? Just because the crawl space is too low and she can't climb into it. I have no words. At first I was pretty disoriented, but then I figured out that we have to jump onto the ledge with the motorcycle and break through the floor. After killing a few bats, two ice wraiths chase us. Ice wraith wraith? Such a hard word. By luring them into the water it freezes. Or at least it's supposed to freeze. Hello? Ah, finally. That was quite a trek just to get to this switch. Good thing I saved because I missed it first. Some of the soldiers shoot grenades. A little overkill maybe? I wouldn't do that. Later we shoot a barrel next to a helicopter. Why? What are you asking me for? Well, the explosion would have destroyed the machine guns, but we already did that. Take that, game. A lever opens a gate which leads us to the next part. Chambers of Tulun revolves around the Chambers of Tulun. There are giant beetles flying around. Don't even bother using the pistols, it takes forever. The shotgun is your friend here. To get to the next part we have to spin a wheel to open a door. There's only one problem. It's protected by a goddamn minotaur. This dude can't be killed and his impressive hammer makes the ground shake. The shockwave hurts Lara so all we can do is run. We lure him into the chambers and pull a switch that closes the doors for a limited time. Now we have to use the rope to swing out of here. Great, rope swinger with a time limit. What more could you ask for? And then a fucking bug is craving attention. With barely enough time left we make it past the door but it's impossible to get up the ladder with that asshole slamming his hammer on the ground. I don't know if this is on purpose but climbing the ladder on the side rather than the middle makes him stop. Very considerate. That leads us to Citadel Gate. The fixed camera is weird. Lara meets a wounded soldier called Sergeant Aziza who reports to her about a creature. He asks her to get to the northern cemetery to get some items for him so he can get rid of it. Well, he wasn't joking. The creature is a fire-breathing dragon. It also can't be harmed. Just run, run, run and don't get hit by fireballs. Thank god it can't follow us because it's stuck. Man, you can barely see the crocodiles. It's dark as shit. Should use the flares more often. Here's a puzzle I couldn't solve at first. There are symbols on the coffins, but what do they mean? Well, they correspond with numbers which are displayed way up there. It's so easy to miss. To see all of them we have to shoot an explosive arrow at a chest. Man, I wonder how many people gave up on this because they didn't look up. Anyway, pulling the switches in the right combination makes the coffins move, revealing entrances. One of my most hated secrets involves a rope. Why is it so difficult to aim the jumps? It's been over 20 years and I still can't figure it out. I like the part where we jump across awnings. You fucking bug! Next to a truck we find a nitrous oxide canister. Then we make it all the way back past the dragon. Then we make it all the way past the dragon and talk to Sergeant Aziza. If only the cutscene would load. This game sometimes. He tells us that our bike needs modifications. I suppose so. Nitrous oxide connected to the carburetor should give you the extra punch. Back in Chambers of Tulun we run past the Minotaur, get on the bike and move on to trenches. Why are these guys shooting at Lara anyways? She's not the enemy. Another machine gun can be destroyed before it sees us if we're really careful. The first time around you'd never see it coming. This is incredibly atmospheric. With the green fog and stuff, great. I just wish we could aim with the laser sight while crouching. Now we gotta crawl past the steam pipes while a soldier rains bullets on us. Not cool. From here we can destroy a flamethrower. Oh what the hell? We can't get out of here because the crawl space isn't high enough again? I can't believe this. We pick up the weapon key code. With this item the machine guns won't fire at us anymore. It's like we're a member of the club. While shimmying along here, be patient. Unlike me. 
Now this is some jeep shit. We have to use the crowbar on the jeep to pry out the valve pipe. You can barely see it, let alone know that you can interact with it. Then it's all the way back to the bike as we return to Chambers of Tulun once again. We combine the valve pipe with the nitrous oxide canister to get the nitrous oxide feeder and... No. It's supposed to go on the motorcycle, but nothing happens. I tried for over a minute until the game finally allowed me to attach it. Our bike now has nitro. Aw yeah! This way we can jump over pits and obstacles to reach new areas. We're in a building with many doors that's guarded by soldiers. Where there's a torch, there's fire. What do we do with it? We use it to set off sprinklers. Is this something the average gamer figures out on his own? Because I sure as hell didn't back then. This of course opens all fire exits and allows us to explore more areas. A lever causes a conveyor belt to start, dropping a crate we can climb onto. In a storage room we shoot the lock with a revolver and pick up the roof key. That's all we need to do, so then it's back to the bike. We make an optional trip back to the city of the dead. With that title it should be a tourist hotspot. With our nitro bike we jump over a pit, kill a few soldiers and perform a few tricky jumps to get to a secret. They're not that tricky, but I usually enjoy these. And because I fell into the pit on the way back through Chambers of Tulun and didn't save, I had to do the entire thing all over again. It was only like 3 or 4 minutes, but I was still angry with myself for being so sloppy. As we visit trenches again, I was running around aimlessly until I found a trap door in an alcove. There's something in the way. Wait, now we can aim while crouching? Why didn't it work last time? Huh, damn, he launched a grenade at her. Is this Lara Croft or the female Terminator? Here we use the roof key. There's a button. Let's shoot a normal arrow at it. That also works. All that's left to do is to make another jump with the motorcycle. It's harder than it looks. At the end we climb up a ladder and get to the fifth level in this never-ending maze of a chapter. Street Bazaar starts with another conversation with a dying soldier. He gives Lara the mind detonator body but explains that one of the other soldiers had the codes inside his head, which was taken by something he had never encountered before. So it bit his head off? Gross! What's that noise? In the garage we pick up the car jack body and the handle. These are combined into a car jack which we use to get through an opening. Oh, so lightning is making all that noise. Word of advice, don't get too close to it. Instead we push the box with the wooden top onto the metal plate. This causes it to sink and the lightning destroys half of the bridge. It just happens, man. There's a dead body without a head. Oh well, at least the mine position data is still there. Picking it up triggers an armored bull to come running at us. We certainly have encountered that before. It can smash crates, so we need to get it to shove the wooden boxes away to reach the exit. The AI is terrible and it's a tedious endeavor. But it managed to kill me once, so maybe I'm just as terrible. The exit leads us back to trenches. The only thing we do here is get back to the entry point of Street Bazaar. Why couldn't they just find a way to let us stay there instead of having us going in circles? By leaving the garage through another door, we get to a courtyard that leads us straight back to trenches. Jesus Christ. Here we combine the mine detonator body and the mine position data to create the mine detonator. I wonder what that does. This allows us to push a button that opens a door next to where we left the bike. Nice. From here we drive straight to Citadel Gate. With the bike we run over crocodiles like a psychopath and speed past the dragon. Lara manages to drive Sergeant Aziza to a munitions truck. Watch out Lara, it's right behind you! Sure, keep chit-chatting. Aziza sacrifices himself by crashing into the dragon. Oh my god, its fucking head got torn off. That's brutal. Lara walks into the citadel and that's the end of our five-stage marathon. You know, I actually enjoyed this way more than I would have ever expected. The green levels create an atmosphere that haunts you from beginning to end. You'd expect zombies or mummies to be lurking around here, but with the exception of the minotaur, the dragon and the bull which all can't be killed, we mostly fight soldiers. That's a bit disappointing. I'm still not a fan of running back and forth between levels. If you don't know the stage order, you're gonna run back and forth a lot, only to get to a dead end sooner or later. Or you might miss something like the symbols on the coffins or the valve pipe. 
It's like a never-ending scavenger hunt, always looking for that one item that lets us progress. The levels themselves aren't that exciting to begin with and it all looks very samey after a while. So believe me when I say that I'm so glad we finally get to play a self-contained level again after all this time. Citadel is the final Cairo level. Jean-Yves is tied to a pillar. Lara unties him and is informed that a possessed Werner is nearby. He takes an ancient ceremonial tablet, uses the amulet of Horus to open a door and brings two dead creepy knights back to life. First we need to burn a rope to open a door. There is this tall room with stairs and water. At first I wasn't sure what to do because I missed the crawl space. It's been a while, but it's time to get rid of Werner's goons again. By this point I haven't used the pistols in a while because I have so much ammo for the other weapons. This lever turns off a fire trap. The next room has a compass on the floor and four pedestals with the letters N E W S. Yep. You know where this is going. More pushing and pulling. Boring as hell, but not as drawn out as the planetarium. That's a pretty weird bone disease. With all pedestals in place, three doors open. So we jump into the pool and... What's happening? I'm stuck. Why does she stand on the water? Wait, what? I'm outside the game. I've broken the game. What the fuck? There is nothing I can do. This is one messed up glitch. Thankfully I saved right before this. Let's try again. What? I can't believe this. I tried this five times and every time the same thing happened. I can't continue. Imagine if this happened back then. Like I said, I usually had only one save file, maybe two. You'd either have to cheat or stop the whole fucking game from the beginning. That's unacceptable. Luckily I have a save file for every level and in this instance even one more right before the compass puzzle. This way I didn't have to replay too much. I guess something went wrong here so I'll try a different order this time. Before we jump in the pool, let's see what happens when we throw a flare into it. It sinks. Are you ready? Because I'm not. Geronimo! Phew, thank fucking god. The goal here is to lower the water to gain access to levers and chains. A bit of a maze, but not that hard to figure out. Just die already! Finally! We're approached by the two undead knights. They're slow pokes and not very frightening, but they serve a purpose. Thanks! A little later we meet two more of them and then we get a cutscene. Lara meets Werner, who really wants the armor. She escapes and takes the amulet, leaving Werner trapped. She jumps out of a window and we leave Cairo for good. With the exception of the compass room and that game breaking glitch, the level was pretty cool. After so much green, it was nice to see something else. It provided a nice challenge without relying on too many enemies. Definitely one of the stronger entries. So Cairo as a whole is much better than I ever gave it credit for. Getting lost is a bitch and it gets monotonous after a while, but the atmosphere got me hooked. The game has gotten really dark and I imagine things will only get more sinister. The last chapter of The Last Revelation takes place in Giza. From now on the levels are self-contained for the most part. Sphinx Complex feels apocalyptic with its blood-red sky and ominous thunder. The only enemies we face here are Werner's assassins. One of them drops a silver key right in front of the lock. Practical. This level is littered with deep pits, so we need to watch our step. In a storage building we kill more guys and move shelves. One of the crates contains a metal blade. Look at this. What a picture. The music fits so perfectly. Lara finds a monument and reads what it says. Protect me always from the sands of time. Leave Lara alone. Let's kill those bad guys before they see us. Bam. 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 So satisfying. On the other side we pick up a wooden handle and combine it with a metal blade. And what do we get? A transformer! No, a shovel. Ingenious. What do we do with a shovel? Dig a hole of course. Damn, that's one big ass hole. How long did it take? Her powers know no limits. Sphinx Complex is a rather short level, but I welcome that after the Cairo chapter. The atmosphere is the best yet and I'm eager to find out what's ahead of us. Oh god, I remember this level. Underneath the Sphinx starts with two bulls chasing us. 
We have to trap them in cages. You already know how I feel about the AI. It's a tedious endeavor, but necessary. There are three tiles with hieroglyphs in the center. No clue what to do with them. Nearby is a scrap of paper. So each symbol represents a letter. We have to push the tiles in alphabetical order. <laughs> yeah, that's easy to figure out. No. No, it's not. If you push them in any other order, one of the gates opens. This path is filled with traps and resets the puzzle at the end. So we're better off just reloading. The correct order opens another gate. After falling to our death a few times, we arrive at yet another closed gate. Look at the colored chutes. Maybe we can take a peek with the binoculars. Would you look at that? The combinations for the remaining four gates. Write that shit down. Basically, it's a rehash of San Francis Folly and to the Lost City of Tinnis with four challenges that we can play in any order we like. First, we crawl through a maze filled with spike hazards. Such a slow section. One of the traps leads us to a secret. How mean. With the Stone of Mart in our possession, we move on. Room number two is filled with crocodiles that are about to be blown up. After activating the mechanisms in the four niches, a trap door opens and we pick up the Stone of Capri. The third room is really obscure. Again, there are a bunch of hieroglyphs on the wall, but there's no clue what to do here. Two of them are like mirror images of each other. These are the ones we have to reach into. All the others just throw beetles at us. How would you figure this out other than with trial and error? Terrible puzzle. At least we get the Stone of Ra. The final room is Nightmare Fodder. It's an underwater maze. That in itself is bad enough, but there are five switches we need to pull in the right order. What is the right order? Well, each switch corresponds with a hieroglyph. So they have to be pulled in A to Z order. First off, we don't really know how many switches there are. Not only do we have to swim around like an idiot and write down every symbol we see, but then we also have to find them again in the right order. It's not stated anywhere that they have to be pulled alphabetically. It's just a wild guess at this point. I feel this is way too cryptic. My thalassophobia doesn't really help either. Suffice to say, I think this puzzle is poorly executed. With the stone of atom in our inventory, we return to the closed gate and insert the four stones. We're trapped in a room with drills coming down from the ceiling. Picking up four holy scriptures opens the gate. Damn, the drills look nasty. The next room has hidden blades in the floor. That's just cheap. And that's it. I like the concept of underneath the Sphinx, but none of the challenges are something to brag about. It's quite a drag actually. Plus I fell into pits all the time, which is my own fault. I guess I lost patience. It had a lot of potential, which was slept on unfortunately. In Menkore's pyramid we leave the cave and are immediately attacked by giant poisonous scorpions. They even attack soldiers who are friendly to us unless we hurt them first. Well, he died. I love blowing up the scorpions with super grenades. So satisfying. Not so satisfying are the big beetles. Hate them, especially the noise they make. Inside a building, a guy is under attack. What the game doesn't tell us is that we have to protect him. If he dies, we only get the guard's key. Saving him triggers a cutscene where he also gives us the armory key, which we need for a secret in a later level. The things this game expects us to know. Next we climb a pyramid. This is deceptively tricky because we can only step on certain ledges. More trial and error. Of course beetles torment us while we're at it. At the end we use the guard's key to open the door into the pyramid. This is a short but action packed level which breaks up the pace in a refreshing way. Scorpions are way more interesting to fight than humans. Also the pyramid part is very memorable. Inside Menkor's pyramid has us run past swinging blades. It also marks the return of mummies. You know, the slow and unintimidating kind. What I dislike most about this level is the need to force more rope swinging on us. Here it's not that bad because we just have to jump forwards, but it's still a chore. After doing this a bunch of times, we fight a guardian. Just flip sideways and shoot explosive arrows at it. We pry the western shaft key from the wall and then swing, swing, swing back. The dark tunnel leads us- Say what the fuck, man? Where the hell did that come from? If you don't save every two minutes, you're screwed. Back outside, we exterminate more giant scorpions. Or set ourselves on fire. Your choice. Lara's tripping. 
On top of a small pyramid, we climb down into it. Sure enough, more traps wait for us. Timing is key. Pulling a chain opens a gate leading to the beginning of underneath the Sphinx without a loading screen in the way. Can't get back there anyway. Therefore, we return to Sphinx Complex. Here we just open a gate with the Guardian's key and progress to the next stage. Sadly, this level was rather boring because of the ropes. The second half was a little more exciting though. The confusion continues in the master boss. Outside we first kill a couple of wild dogs with red eyes. At a gas station we pick up a jerry can. Then we enter the first of many master boss. They are connected via tunnels and our goal is to find various items. If we miss anything it'll be hell looking for it. The dark tunnels have lots of dogs inside and it's intense. One shotgun blast is enough to get rid of them though. Often we enter rooms with three lion heads on the walls. By shooting the gems in their mouths, a door opens where usually two mummies protect an item. In this case we pick up the small water skin. This place is completely fucked with all these pits everywhere. But yeah, essentially we do the same thing repeatedly. The next item is a bag of sand. That's always good to have in the desert. What a rare treat. Eventually we reach a room with three scales, each with a different symbol on it. Even I figured this out immediately. We fill the small water skin with water and fill the left scale. In the middle we used the jerry can to fill the scale with oil. With the torch we just found we set it on fire. For the right scale our bag of sand comes in handy. Damn, now we're all out of sand. How will we survive? In the new room we pick up the northern shaft key. The rest is just more of the same. Tunnels, pits and gems. Until we get to another riddle. There are three monkey statues with a lever in front of them. You know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. The left lever releases a bad tempered monkey. The middle releases an almost invisible monkey. The right lever is the one we're supposed to pull. This monkey pulls a handle for us, allowing us to progress. Is there a clue that lets us know we only need to pull the right lever? Not that I'm aware of. Bye bye my simian buddy. All that's left to do is to pick up the southern shaft key. With a shot of Lara's voluptuous polygon knockers, the level ends. The Mastaba seems overly complicated at first with many tunnels and branching paths. But it's really not that head scratching if you take your time. Just make sure you've been everywhere before you climb out of a tunnel. It starts to get old after a while, but I enjoyed the puzzles. The Great Pyramid, not to be confused with The Great Pyramid, pretty much looks like the previous level at first. Only this time instead of dogs, we battle the Werner army of exploding douchebags. It doesn't take long before we arrive at the Great Pyramid. And sweet baby Jesus, this might be the most impressive setting in the entire game. It does its name justice. This is one giant trial and error parkour. One mistake either sends us back or to our untimely death. It's advised to save after every successful jump. Not only do beetles attack us relentlessly, but holy crap, these falling blocks almost give me a heart attack. They come out of nowhere. Most of them are easily avoided by just taking a step at a time. Keyword, most of them. Ouch. It's a slow level and the next step isn't always that obvious. Still, it's an interesting experience and one that stands out in the grand scheme of things. As we slide down the pyramid, we leave the stage. Khufu's Queen's Pyramids has us protect more soldiers from scorpions. Well, at least we tried. There are two bunkers filled with goodies. One of them requires the armory key we got from the soldier in Menkor's Pyramid. Look at this gold mine, we get every single weapon in the game. We already had everything, but still. And look at the secrets counter. 69 secrets. No, I'm not trying to make a lame and overused sexual reference. I just wonder why this couldn't have been the final secret, number 70. It would have been perfect. No other secret gives us this much stuff. A missed opportunity. There are more pyramids to climb and we could already move on to the next stage. But we're missing one essential item. How do we get it? By pushing this random rock to open a door. I mean sure, the rock does stand out a bit, but are you serious? The door leads us to a maze in the pyramid. How do I explain this? Pressure pads raise and lower stone blocks. We can only walk in one direction. It's up to us to find the right path. Along the way we kill normal sized scorpions and walk past several niches. Some contain items, others swarms of beetles. As far as I know there is no indication of what you'll get, so it's just another shitty gamble. At the end another guardian waits for us. 
After picking up the eastern shaft key, we have to find our way out of the maze. Then we're off to the Great Pyramid again. Same thing as last time. We use our favorite key to open the doors to the pyramid. Atmospherically, the level is top notch, but there is one major problem I have with mazes in general. They're boring. Add beetles and it's a part I think doesn't need to exist. Scaling the pyramid also starts to get repetitive. Now we're inside the Great Pyramid. Here's a tunnel with rails on the side. For tourists, I guess. Werner's guys got here before us. What's up with these block traps? How does this even work? Seriously, I need to know. We have to light all the torches to open a door in true Zelda fashion. The switch opens a door above us. This is where we finally place the four shaft keys which activate some sort of blue light beam that blows a hole in the floor. That's way too deep. Ooh, yikes! Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the final secret of the game. How underwhelming. That's what I meant. They should have left out this secret entirely. As we climb down this wall, we exit the level. It's short, but alright. Nothing that stands out really except for the shaft of blue light. Folks, we've almost made it. Temple of Horrors is the final level. There's some weird monster in the cage. Creepy. There are a total of three scale puzzles. We pick up the large water skin. On the wall we get a clue as to how many liters of water need to be poured into the pitcher on the left side of the scale. Pour in the wrong amount and the monster is released. We stand in the pool and have to fill the small water skin which holds 3 liters of water and the large water skin which holds 5. We can pour water from one into the other. Wait a minute, this is fucking math! I don't wanna solve math problems in a Tomb Raider game. In all honesty, it's really easy. In the first room we need 2 liters, then 4, and in the final room, 1. At the end we make our way down to the statue of Horus. No, not like that. We make our way down safely and place the 4 holy scriptures on the pedestals. In a cutscene Lara places the armor we've been carrying around for half the game on the statue and puts the amulet on its muscular chest. A blue falcon slams into the statue, bringing it to life. Suddenly a swarm of locusts make Horus explode, leaving Set in its place instead. So what was all that good for? I can barely understand what he's saying. This is the final stretch of the game. We pick the amulet of Horus out of the water. Somehow we have to make it up again. This means we have to pull a few switches first. Meanwhile Set shoots blue energy bolts at us. This reminds me an awful lot of the quote unquote fight against Sophia Lee. He also can't be killed by our weapons. For the most part I think the path forward is quite obvious. The challenging part is avoiding damage. Once we're surrounded by blue light we're safe. I think. We climb up and insert the amulet to seal Set inside the cave for good. But we still need to get out. Wow. Imagine if Lara really died this close to the end. Giant stone blocks smash down from the ceiling. Skulls indicate where we're allowed to step. Before we leave this place, let's take a quick look at our litterbug inventory. Even though I barely used the pistols for half the game, I still had so much stuff left. Maybe I should stop using them altogether. At least until I find the first weapon. Temple of Horus is kind of a weak final level. The scale puzzle feels a bit out of place and the final encounter with Set is nothing we haven't seen before really. Anyway, in the final cutscene Lara seems to be weakened by her long journey. Assuming this all took place in one day, I can only imagine how she feels. A non-possessed Werner suddenly appears and tries to rescue her. I couldn't leave you. Lara doesn't make it in time. The tomb collapses and buries her inside. So Lara is dead? It sure seems like it. What a depressing ending. This of course happened because Core Design was getting sick of Tomb Raider. By killing her off, they hoped they wouldn't have to make more games, but oh how wrong they were. I learned about Lara's death in an article in a video game magazine before I had finished the game. It might have been the first time I got really pissed off at a spoiler. I got worried we wouldn't get another Tomb Raider game after this, but oh how wrong I was. The credit sequence is odd. We just witnessed Lara die and they give us this upbeat music. It reminds me of the James Bond flick on Her Majesty's Secret Service, where after the maybe saddest moment in the entire series, they blast the James Bond theme at the viewers during the credits. It completely ruins the mood. And what do we get for collecting all secrets? Tomb Raider 3 and Golden Mask gave us bonus levels. The last revelation? Nothing. 
absolutely fucking nothing. That's frustrating because it's such a chore to get them in this game. Sure, they reward us with items, but they don't need to be classified as secrets. Heck, I would have been fine with having secret number 69 be the reward for collecting every secret. It's better than nothing. We can at least pretend there is a bonus for all secrets. Did you know there's an exclusive level for PC? As most of you know, the first three games each had PC exclusive add-ons with additional levels. The Last Revelation didn't get such an add-on. Instead it got one level that was exclusive to the Times of London newspaper in late 1999. Why did this happen? They were honoring the discovery of the pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb. This was financed partially by the Times in the early 1920s. So what better way to celebrate than with a Tomb Raider level? On tombraiders.net you can download the level for free without owning the main game. That's great, because I only own the first three games on PC. This is the only classic Tomb Raider stage I've never played yet, so I'm quite excited. Let's check it out. The Times exclusive Tomb Raider level is such a great title for a level. It starts with a cutscene. Laura talks with editor-in-chief of the Times, Peter Stoddard. Basically new tunnels to a tomb near the one of Tutankhamun have been discovered. He persuades her to check it out. Well this is why we've called you. After doing some reading in their archives, she's ready to go. We start with only our pistols. I suppose the menu isn't supposed to look like that. I gotta say, the game looks beautiful on PC. It's obviously more enhanced than on PlayStation, but I feel like this is a huge improvement over the previous PC versions as well. The attention to detail is stunning. Personally, I'm so used to the gritty and dirty look of the PlayStation originals that the clean PC visuals almost put me off. To my surprise, this level even has secrets. Now we already have the shotgun. The first enemies are scorpions. Oh no, a spiked ball. Is this foreshadowing something? I bet these jackals come to life later. Look, they even bleed when we shoot them. Hey, this looks familiar. I always wondered where that loading screen in the main game comes from. By shooting the lion heads, a trap door opens which leads us to the second and final secret and the crossbow. Then I ran around clueless for a minute until I saw this golden urn. Sure enough, it can be moved. This of course awakens the jackals. How is that fair? They can move, but we're stuck in cutscene mode. Take a bite of my shotgun, assholes. Mummies on the floor. Yep. They come alive. As we have no explosives, all we can do is run away from them. In a room with a pool and a boat, we get attacked by crocodiles. What's the point of this boat exactly? One of the vases contains the revolver. That's all the weapons we get. This next room gave me trouble, but only because I'm an impatient prick. Some of the vases contain beetles. That's not necessarily a problem, but I kept jumping into the flames like four times. Lara Christ. Here we find the laser sight, which we get to use shortly after. By shooting two more lion heads, a pit gets filled with sand so that we can traverse to the other side. Disgusting mummies wait for us, but here comes a spike ball. Take that! Oh man. In this impressive looking room we take the gold mask, not to be confused with the golden mask. Then we get chased by beetles and we have to lure them over the grates. As we walk up the steps past some statues, the level ends and we get the credits. This stage is quite short, but I like it a lot. This is classic Tomb Raider by the books, without being cryptic at any point. You can see it as a demo, it's a great introduction for new players. If you haven't played it, go check it out. It's free, so there's no excuse to give it a pass. Man, what a marathon. Let's talk about the music and sound so we can calm down a bit. The sound effects in general have improved in my opinion, creating an overall more immersive experience. Echoing steps, enemies in the distance, it just sounds right. The weapons sound just as satisfying as in the third game. What I can't stand are the menu effects, especially when you scroll through items. It's awful. Lara isn't voiced by Judith Gibbons anymore. Though not anymore. So after you. Janelle Elliott takes her place and her performance is highly regarded in the community. Personally, I'm conflicted about her performance. Now don't get me wrong, she does a great job and I don't want to criticize her amazing work. Her voice fits perfectly for Lara. It's just that I feel her delivery is a little more sassy and arrogant than the previous two voice actresses. It's hard to describe. This attitude problem. You people need to learn some manners. I like it better when Lara isn't like that. Maybe it's the writing, I don't know. In this game it's okay though, I feel stronger about that in the next couple of games. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Werner has a voice I love to hate. I'm scarred by my experience as a child, having to replay that first level a million times. But I have to give credit where credit is due. 
It's a standout performance and so memorable. Enough of this tedious banter, Miss Croft. It is time for you to realize... Miss Croft? Some of the cutscenes are a little hard to understand, but maybe that's just me. What this game does better than its elders are the ambient sounds. Sure, I like individual sounds from the past better, like the classic echoes in the caves, but there's a lot more variety here. Whether it's wind, echoes, thunder or the haunting sounds of Cairo, this game nails ambience like no TR game before it. That means it's almost never completely quiet. I really like the stillness of the first game, so I'm conflicted about it. It's probably good that every game has its own unique style. The music was composed by Peter Connolly, who previously helped out on the third entry and would go on to compose for the next two installments also. I think most of us can agree that Nathan McCree was the king of Tomb Raider soundtracks. He created the signature sound we all know and love. That's a tough act to follow. I've never been a huge fan of Connolly's style because it's so different. Today I appreciate it more. I feel the music comes up more frequently and there's many themes for different moods. A lot of the pieces are short, either setting up the mood for a spooky scene, scaring us or giving us a sense of wonder as we explore the depths of a tomb. Even the classic Tomb Raider theme manages to sneak in here and there. Speaking of theme songs, sadly I don't really care for this one. It's objectively a good song and kind of melancholy actually. It would have been a great fit for the credits. But as the main theme of the game, it never vibed with me. Overall, I feel this soundtrack is more cinematic, but not as memorable or catchy as its missing standout tracks. I don't get the same emotions as when I hear music from the trilogy. There's only one little track I don't like. The Memories. Fun fact, the Dreamcast version has a bonus remix of the title theme by Paul Oakenfold. This is so 90s. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of this score, it's still a great listening experience that fits really well to the Egyptian setting. So let's honor the best of the best. Here are my top 5 songs from Tomb Raider The Last Revelation. Number 5. This is a minimalistic track but it works so well. It makes us wonder what the solution to that complicated puzzle is. Number 4. During the Jeep sequences we get to hear this upbeat techno song that kinda reminds me a bit of the snow scooters theme from TR2. It turns up the fun dial for sure. Number 3. Like many other tracks, this one is very short but leaves a strong impact. Even as it fades out, it keeps us on our toes. Number 2. This might be the creepiest track of the entire soundtrack. You just know something bad is about to happen. Number 1. The bonus level theme builds up slowly and then explodes into auditory awesomeness. Damn, this slams so hard and I genuinely love it. Let's finally wrap this up. I don't even know where to start. This game is a lot better than I ever gave it credit for. How's that for a start? Yeah, I used to hate this game. About 9 years ago I wrote a script about my official Tomb Raider ranking and this game was at the very bottom. I never finished the video. Where did my hate come from? Well, it changed too much. As someone who absolutely loved the structure of the trilogy when it comes to levels, menus and so on, this just didn't do it for me. The huge interconnected levels confused the hell out of me and it all felt like work. I wasn't having fun. Fast forward a few years. I'm over 30 years old now and I think I've matured since then. On this playthrough I tried to keep an open mind and really took my time. First of all, on a technical level, this game improves on the third game. The lighting is much more natural and dynamic. Overall the environments feel less blocky than before, giving them more of a natural and realistic touch. 
Lara's character model has also been improved. Do I need to point out the obvious? She must have a constant back pain carrying those magnificent melons around. No, what I actually meant was her face. During cutscenes her lips move. It's very basic, but back then I was impressed. The story is much more engaging with a bigger dose of cutscenes. The plot feels much more present than before. That said, I feel it was a bit all over the place sometimes and I didn't always understand what was going on. Like I said, I had trouble understanding everything they said, especially Set. Thank God for the internet. The fact that it's all Lara's fault that this is happening gives it a stronger sense of urgency. Like, oh shit, I caused all this mayhem. The sky gradually changing color over the course of the game is a strike of genius. I'm still on the fence concerning the level structure. If you really take your time, it's not impossible to figure out what to do, but I don't believe anyone who claims they managed to beat this game without a walkthrough on the first try without at least getting stuck once or twice, especially with all the secrets. I may be completely wrong about this and I was probably too young for this game when it came out. I'll always prefer the linear level structure with self-contained stages over stuff like Alexandria or Cairo. Today I'm more fond of Cairo's dark and creepy setting but it's too confusing and boring at times. Alexandria turned out to be my least favorite part of the game. It wasn't as confusing as I remembered, but some of those levels really dragged. The less said about Cambodia, the better. This is not how you do tutorials. End of story. The Valley of the Kings and Karnak are probably my favorite chapters. The tomb settings are really awesome and do what this series does best. Giza also has its moments, but by that point I'm completely worn out by the game. Just like this video you're watching right now, the last revelation is too long. It just feels never ending. Thanks for watching by the way. Too many moments or solutions to puzzles are frustratingly cryptic and I'm not ashamed to admit that I had to look up stuff from time to time. Getting stuck is not fun. What I distaste the most is how they handled the secrets. I think we've discussed that enough already. We don't even get a statistics screen at the end. Not at the end of levels, not at the end of the game. Instead we have to look it up in the pause menu. Why remove something that was useful and interesting? The menu itself is a downgrade. In the other games we had different rows for different purposes. Here everything is in the same row and it takes forever to find something. What irritates me the most is that the armor of Horus is in here for like half of the game. It's just in the way. Why do I have to scroll past all of these items which we don't use until the final level? While we're at it, I still can't stand the save system. I know it would have been difficult to have a level select screen like before with all these interconnecting levels. But like I said, I only had room for like two save files on my memory card back then. Considering how many game breaking bugs you can encounter, that's a major problem. I only encountered two on this playthrough and I consider myself lucky. Play it on PC if possible. On PS3 I had to create like 6 or 7 digital PS1 memory cards to get a save file of every level. The weapon selection has been toned down a bit, but we get different forms of ammo instead. The explosive arrows are by far the best addition. I never really used the poison arrows and the flash grenades, but that's just me. You don't really run at risk of running out of ammo, as items are scattered everywhere. It's also cool that the items you pick up appear in the bottom corner like they did in the first two games. As someone who didn't like most of the vehicles in TR3, I'm glad we only get two here. Both control quite well, the jeep being my favorite. This was Lara's biggest adventure yet and it sure feels like it. Most of it takes place in Egypt, the quintessential Tomb Raider setting. But the chapters vary a lot from each other and sometimes have unique enemies. I like that we have to outsmart some of them as they can't be killed by conventional means. I do get annoyed by the beetles, big and small, and my least favorite enemies are the black robed dudes. The AI is a bit smarter than in previous games. You can't just run in circles because the enemies track your movement and keep aiming at you while they're stationary. The Last Revelation is an ambitious title that might have been ahead of its time in terms of level design. It tried new things like a train level but ultimately the Tomb Raider formula started to get a bit stale. I understand why the developers were getting tired of it. If you thought the third game was hard, this one might drive you nuts. I'm glad I replayed it and got to see it with a fresh perspective. I consider it a good game that has many things going for it, but it's not great. That's why I have to rank it at the bottom of my list of games I've reviewed so far. Ultimately, everyone feels different about this game and this is just my humble opinion. If you liked it back then, chances are you'll still like it. 
If you're like me and have bad memories of it, then you still might feel the same way. There is a possibility, however, that it'll grow on you if you really give it a chance. It has grown on me quite a bit, but I'm still very critical of it and won't replay it as often as the prequels. It's just too annoying for its own good. Hey everyone, this is G from. Thank you so much for watching episode 2 of season 3. Feel free to rate, comment, subscribe and follow me on Instagram. I'll see you later. Have a nice day.